Hey, this is Chris with Collision Hub, and we are back at NACE 2012 in New Orleans, and today we're going to start off the show with a little bit of discussion of mechanical. Now, in collision repair, we do a lot of mechanical, a little bit here and there, and especially missing with the coolant systems and refrigeration, and a lot has changed this year when it comes to refrigeration, and quite frankly, I'm lost, so I've called in the expert. Pete, thanks for joining me this morning. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Appreciate the opportunity, Chris. Now, for those of you that follow both of us on ABRN.com and the website, you'll flip over and see him on the motor side, mechanical, doing postings and shows. And so you are the mechanical side of my brain. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> when, I, when I need to go to, you're my guy. So, Pete, all year long I've been hearing about changes in 134, uh, counterfeit 134, all kinds of things that repairers, whether you're a mechanical or a collision shop, maybe doing the recharge on systems, need to know about. So, fill me in. What's changed sure. this year? Well, I tell you, let's, <clears throat> before we get into really into big changes, let me just say this. Uh, refrigerant quantities have become much smaller over the last several years. Uh, oil quantities have become much smaller. Uh, any collision shop or any mechanical shop, for that matter, that's been doing repair, uh, has to be much, much more precise in, in recharging and servicing these systems. So that's, that's a given for any of the systems that you're going to deal with on late model cars. Uh, but I think what you're referring to is the new refrigerant, HFO 1234 YF. That's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. <laughs> Can I blame DuPont for that? <laughs> uh, uh, actually, it started several years ago. The European Commission uh, decided that 134A is damaging to the ozone, damaging to the uh, environment. And uh, they go by what's called the uh, global warming potential of the refrigerant. And I think R134A is something like 1,400. Uh, wow. and, and the e EC decided that for any model sold in Europe, uh, that needed to be replaced with a refrigerant that got under 150. So the search began. Uh, there were several candidates involved. Uh, first was carbon dioxide, R744. Uh, but that is a very high pressure refrigerant. Um, would take what's called a, a, a secondary loop system in order to put it into a car. Uh, very briefly, what a secondary loop system is, uh, all the refrigerant uh, system is under the hood, and it's used to chill an uh, ethylene glycol coolant, which is then passed through into the cabin to provide the cooling for the, for the uh, passengers. Uh, so that was one that was looked at. It, it's pretty good because it has a global warming potential, I think, of zero being carbon dioxide, so that, that well, works. Well, that gets it under the 150. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, it does, 150. Um, but like I said, the cost of the system and the, and the high pressures involved uh, could pose dangers to the technicians and the occupants, so that was kind of put off to the side. Uh, some other candidates came along, uh, then came 1234YF, which ended up being the one chosen as the acceptable replacement. Uh, now, let me stress right now that for our market, it is not a requirement in the United States to use 1234YF. Uh, this is only applying to European vehicles. Now, whether the manufacturers decide to use it in their cars is entirely up to them. Um, it's gone through the EPA process and it's been accepted as an approved refrigerant on the EPA SNAP list, so that's okay. Uh, a few OEM manufacturers have gone to it. GM, notably, has two models in 2013 that will use 1234YF. Uh, but the only reason they're doing it is for the CAFE credits. Uh, they have to meet certain fuel mileage requirements, and they earn credits by moving to something that's emissions friendly. Now, what are those two models that General Motors is looking at for next year? Um, the XTS is one, and uh, the second one escapes me uh, right offhand, but again, it's not the okay. top of the line Cadillac. All right, so in those, is it those larger SUVs that they're, you know, to help? No, an offset for them on those CAFE standards that they're going to look at that system for? Or? Well, they, the CAFE standards uh, are become very stringent. Uh, that's one reason they use the uh, new refrigerant in those vehicles to get the credits. That's where you're seeing such a marked or, or even faster increase in hybrids. Uh, you can see a lot of four-cylinder uh, power plants made it to hybrids, and that's the only way you're going to get the four-cylinder power plant uh, in order to bring those numbers down and, yes, offset the, the bigger V6s and, and the few remaining V8s. Wow. So. Um, the 1234YF, what's going to be the impact on us? Even the EPA hasn't finished all their decision making. Uh, there are going to be a few vehicles you're going to see in use, uh, but the real short story is if you're in the aftermarket, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep about it right now. Uh, there's going to be very, very few out there to begin with. Uh, for at least the next three years, they're going to be under factory warranty. So if there's an issue with the system, you know, the dealers can take care of it. Uh, in terms of you know, getting equipment to deal with them, 
personally, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, if you're a collision shop and you get a vehicle in that's equipped with 1234YF, that one rare case, uh, send it to the dealer. You know, let them pull the gas out and put the gas back in. Uh, what you do want to be aware of during repair, though, is if there's any damage to some of the components, they have to be replaced with new certified components, specifically the evaporator. If that's damaged, that has to be replaced with a known new component. Uh, other than that, service and repair and diagnosis is, is very similar to 134A. So we got a, a few years probably before we're going to have to deal with this full time. Any other refrigerant issues? Because it just seemed like the first of the year there was all kinds of, of, of talk around refrigerant and servicing that yeah. and concerns. And, you know, most of the shops we work with are doing two, three recharges a day. And I don't think that we stay on top of mechanical news. Um, we just kind of roll with the punches. Sure. If I did it yesterday, I'm going to do it today. Sure. Um, anything we got we need to know from your perspective right now? Well, it, I strongly encourage any shop performing uh, AC repair to invest in a refrigerant identifier. Uh, and what this is, is before you retrieve the, the refrigerant that's in the car into your equipment, you want to know what it is that you're taking in. Um, there are uh, aftermarket blends available. Um, there may be sealant in the system that you don't want getting into your recovery equipment. And an identifier is a very quick way to tell that. Um, you may also find on, the, on a rare occasion there has been some issues with counterfeit refrigerants being sold in the United States. Uh, the containers may look exactly like the factory containers. Uh, but like my mama told me, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Somebody, yeah, it can't be that cheap. That guy that right. came around with that pallet that was half price, there was a reason. Right, probably. you have to be careful with that. One of the contaminants that has shown up in a few instances, uh, mainly in U.S. military vehicles overseas right now, uh, and, and commercial shipping containers, has been a, a refrigerant called R40. Uh, R4, R40 is bad stuff, bad news. It actually, when released to the atmosphere, it causes an explosive gas. Uh, and so it's very dangerous stuff. Um, that's probably an extreme case. You may never, ever, ever run into it. But you could run into a situation where somebody put a household R22 into their car in an attempt to save money. You pull that into your machine without knowing it's there. Now you've contaminated your own supply, and you're passing that along to the customers that you're recharging. So those uh, testing systems, do they, are they part of a, If I've got an existing machine, is it an attachment that I buy, or is it something separate that the shops need to look for to go purchase? If you already have a 134A machine, then uh, you can purchase this, the identifier. There are several models available, uh, starting at a very reasonable rates. Uh, I think like 500 bucks at, at the low end for a basic go, no go um, identifier. Or to the higher end, that tells you exactly what's in there, what the percentages are, if there's air in the system, how much air, if there's a different refrigerant, R12, when it should be R134A, anything like that, it'll spell it out for you on a printout that you can keep you know, with the records and uh, and then save it for your, your files. It's definitely worth the investment to save my customer's car, but also save my machines and stuff that I'm not only counting for for that cost sure. of that equipment, but maybe I've got a stockpile of work to do that day and I can't have it go down. Sure. So and, I definitely and, need it. And if you walk through some of the uh, discount stores, uh, you see the little bottles of R134A sitting on the shelves. You know, a lot of us know that we come up behind do-it-yourselfers that always think that if a little's good, a lot's better. Pour so, four cans in that PD, it works great. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Every can I've been seeing lately contains a sealant. That may or may not be a good thing. Uh, you can also get a sealant detection. Very simple process. You screw it on the, the, the valve. There's a cartridge in there. If there's a sealant in there, it quickly blocks that orifice and tells you that there's something in there that shouldn't be. You don't want that in your machine because if it reacts with moisture in your machine, now it's clogged up that you know three, four, five thousand dollar piece of equipment. It'll go down. You got to get it repaired. You know the nightmare that goes with that when you yeah. depend on it. And we had a, I mean, across the country this year, we had a, a nice drought everywhere. It was a hot, hot summer. So yeah. I imagine we had a lot of customers going out and thinking that their AC wasn't working. But, you know, hey, it can only do so much. And we probably right. have a lot of home do-it-yourselfers. Went to AutoZone, went to O'Reilly's, bought that charge kit, thinking they were going to jump their air up, get it a little cooler. Right. And we're going to see those cars in the collision shop. And it's going to probably, you know, kind of ruin my machine here by the end of the year. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It sure will. So now you get to get out and see everything that's coming out down the pipe. What's new with uh, mechanics and electronics and what's coming in cars? What's got your interest peak? What are you looking for in 2013? You know, the, the mechanical side of our business is changing at, at lightning speed. Um, the, probably some of the more recent uh, developments that have come out. Um, first part of August, the Department of Transportation uh, partnered with the University of Michigan and several OEM manufacturers to conduct the largest real-world experimentation of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications ever. Um, if your audience isn't familiar with that, 
Uh, we know that there's blind spot monitoring, uh, front collision avoidance on new cars, radar, uh, camera systems, all of these things that, that uh, you collision guys are going to be dealing with. Uh, but these systems are wireless, and they can actually send out data to other equipped cars up to 1,000 feet. They send out position, uh, direction of movement, and speed. So the car is able to paint a picture of the environment around it, whether it has line of sight or not. Uh, now, what's the advantage? The best example I use, and we've all been there, uh, you're driving up to the stoplight, light's red, you stop, you see, waiting for it to turn green, turns green, you take your foot off the brake, get ready to go, and something tells you your spidey sense ticks off, right? And you slam on the brake just in time to have the 18-wheeler that blew the light pass in front of your bumper, you know? These systems would have known that truck was coming. And when you took your foot off the brake, the car would say, uh-uh, you don't want to go and start flashing off warning indications telling you that there's going to be a potential safety problem. Uh, 3,000 vehicles on the road in Ann Arbor, Michigan, if you live in Ann Arbor, that are equipped with this technology, uh, it's expected to take about a year to complete the survey, but I would not at all be surprised if three to five years down the road, uh, this became uh, part of DOT's rulemaking and we saw it on cars. <laughs> Pete, I'm only good at one thing, and that's fixing cars and painting them. And if that stuff comes out, I mean, I'm going to be calling you for a job because I'm not going to have anything else to do. And it is impressive to see how they're going with anti, you know, anti-crash and avoidance technologies, and where that's going to drive our claim rate. I mean, we've yeah. got a declining, we've got a declining group of, you know, of drivers in the ages of 16 seeking driver's license. And then now, if I'm going to have a declining claim system, I kind of I count on those snowy weathers and things to bring some that, cars that, into yeah, me. Yeah, you're right. That and and it will prevent that. Um, the main focus of this is that that um, a lot of accidents are caused by momentary lapses of, of concentration. And these systems are designed to wake you up, you know, to avoid that. But the number of lives lost due to these types of accidents, I think it's 30, like 33,000 a year. That's for an hour. So if there's a system that we can put in to quote the, the DOT director's uh, comments, you know, we spent the last 50 years protecting ourselves from collision. We're gonna focus on the next 50 years on avoiding them in the first place. So yes, I guess that will be a challenge yeah. for your industry. Well, we can't do we can't say anything bad about something that saves a life. So I guess in our business, we hope that things are still going to happen and and that yeah. we're still going to have a chance to fix a car, but just that everybody's There's okay. There's still people texting and, and drinking too much, so I'm sure you'll have plenty of bent metal to, to work on. <laughs> it's sad to say. Can we hope? No, I'm just <laughs> Well, stay tuned with Collision Hub. We're going to be back at NACE 2012 with more coverage from the floor, more equipment, more products, more demos, and more training to make sure that 2013 is the best year your shop's ever had. Thanks.